Okay, our next speaker is uh, Cynthia Buteau. She's the Director of Business Development at CASIS, the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about that organization and the R&D that they do. Thank you. And um, I really don't like the, the uh, placement of this talk right now after having just been very much inspired by Dean. Um, so, and, and, and in my day, I was always uh, talked about as having a lot of energy, but I don't think uh, that computes compared to what I just saw. Um, and T Tara, I really liked your talk earlier today. Um, you know, we've heard from the scientists, we've heard from the engineer, and now this talk is really about the business side. And that's my background. Um, I am the business person, the director of business development for CASIS. And hopefully what we'll do over the next few minutes is give you an idea practically how you can access the International Space Station as a national lab. So I think Tara did a great job talking about what are the, what are the cool types of science that can take place on station. And I think Dan just talked about from an engineering standpoint and from a 3D printing standpoint, there's a lot going on. Ultimately, our organization, CASES, has been established so that you as entrepreneurs, you as students, can actually access that, that space station. Let's see. Is it, I'll have to do it by the computer? Oh, okay. All right. No? Well, we can. All right, so we've seen the International Space Station, and basically the reason that we were uh, created, what do you want me to do? You can go back up on the screen. Okay, you tell okay. Me okay. You go. all right. So basically, we were created as a, a 501c3 to manage the inter International Space Station as a national lab. And the real difference between what we do and what NASA is doing is we're focused on what is that impact on Earth? What can you do from a research and technology development perspective on station, in space, that's actually going to uh, physically and uh, benefit you here on Earth? Okay? We were created, there's this long timeline, and I think Tara made a really good point, which was, you know, the, the um, International Space Station was an engineering marvel. And it was built over a number of years. And it was actually about three years ago where we were created to manage that lab that construction of the space station actually completed. And in a sense, we were open for business. And ultimately, that's right at the time that the space shuttle program ended. So lots of times, folks, when, we, when we're out talking uh, you know, to researchers, there's this there's this lack of awareness. There's this you know, sort of misunderstanding that when the space shuttle program ended, that's actually when um, the International Space Station was open for business. And it's amazing how many people aren't necessarily aware of that or aware of the fact that it's a permanently crewed uh, orbiting uh, laboratory that you guys all have access to. Next. Just Quickly, um, you know, NASA still exists, obviously, we're going to hear a lot from NASA over the, you know, you've heard from them yesterday, you're going to hear from them today. NASA still exists, still does um, long duration space flight, missions to Mars, all of the cool things you've been hearing about. The reason why we exist in that little quadrant to the left is to actually manage the International Space Station as the national lab. So just like you see national labs across the country, we're like that, except we're 260 miles north. Next. What do we do? So for the, again, the entrepreneurs in the room, why would you think of doing research in space? And when we go out and we talk to big companies, you know, why would you think about doing research in space? There's tremendous value. And in terms of the space station being built over the, you know, the number of years it took, um, there was a lot of infrastructure, and all of that is actually you know, value that we're not passing those costs off to you. So the ride up, the on-station time where the astronaut is actually your lab tech, the ride back down with your experiment, all of the consulting services that we do to help translate your ground-based project to space, all of those types of things um, we valued out. And the average 
cost or the actual va or average value of that is about seven and a half million dollars. And again, that's free to you. We're not passing any of those costs off to you. So a big part of what we're doing from a cases perspective is trying to build that awareness and educate folks as to what's really possible. Next. So we sit in the middle. We work with NASA. We work with you as the researcher. And um, we work with uh, these third parties, these hardware providers, to actually make sure that your project can fly. Next. I'm not going to go into these three next slides, but I think it was really interesting in terms of what Tara talked about when she uh, did her first talk this morning. A lot of what we do is in the life science area. So what you're going to see across the screen is a typical drug development and or de uh, development and delivery cycle. And each one of those areas are areas that we've actually seen successful research. So from protein crystallization, where you know Tara showed you some really cool stuff around that, which helps drugs um, be targeted better, all the way through delivery systems, where you know she showed you the water and the, the way that water reacts in space, the whole micro encapsulation and microfluidics associated with space is something that we're seeing our life science companies use that phenomena to develop better delivery drug systems. And it's interesting because it's still scheduled for tomorrow, but SpaceX 6 is scheduled to fly tomorrow. And we've got three uh, life science companies of ours that are going up. So we've got Merck, who's doing a protein crystallization experiment. We've got Novartis, that's doing a, um, an osteoporosis and a muscle wasting type of experiment. And then we've got a third one, which is I'll talk about in a little bit, which is more on the um, synthetic muscle side, so it's probably more considered a materials project. But really tangibly, these companies have taken the phenomena that you heard Tara talk about a lot um, and actually translate that into meaningful uh, research for them. Next. And the same thing what we're seeing with industrial and material type companies. So whether it be a petroleum company, a consumer product company, an advanced material company, they're using those phenomena, the microgravity-enabled uh, materials, so optical fibers and semiconductors and all of the stuff that I think probably a lot of the folks uh, involved in this uh, hackathon over the weekend are probably going to be interested in, all the way through to more of the consumer product type companies where they're looking at shelf life and they're looking at optimal product formulation. How do you put the least amount of an expensive ingredient into a formulation and still have it be viable? How do you extend your, your shelf life? How do you get the oil off the top of the peanut butter? And we're actually working with companies on those very tangible experiments now. And next. The last area that we focus on is technology and aerospace development. So we are using that International Space Station as a platform, a testbed platform, or a TRL raising platform. So anybody interested in satellites and um, you know any sort of remote sensing application, we're seeing a lot of activity and using uh, the station for that. Next. I would say that one of the big um, areas that we're looking at now, so for all of you guys that are uh, interested in any of these Earth observation technologies. We're looking at platform right now in terms of hyperspectral, in terms of LIDAR, thermal. Ultimate, ultimately, what we're looking at doing is how do you actually enhance your ability to do data observation, perhaps using all of these together and do data layering? or data fusion, those types of techniques. And we're actively looking at a strategy to work with vendors and also work with those downstream uh, data applications. So again, we saw pictures earlier of cloud formations and weather. I mean, we're working with a company now that's looking at a technology to better detect um, uh, tropical cyclones using these types of technology as well as uh, sort of da data analyt analytics. Okay. The last thing that I would say before I give you some really specific examples, you know, the reason why you actually would do research on station is because the science is, is cutting edge. You can do things there that you cannot do anywhere else, literally. But ultimately, from a, a cases standpoint, 
we're enabling you to actually get benefit from a marketing and branding standpoint. So this notion of spaces in it, creating a seal um, or a space patch with your specific company or your specific project, again, that's a big part of how we work with entrepreneurs who are looking at it from that, from that standpoint. One of the examples of the companies that we're working with now is Cobra Puma. And we're going to be flying uh, one of their golf clubs doing a metals project. And ultimately, they're looking at how do you uh, integrate the spaces in it branding into what they do. And I believe Ricky Fowler is actually going to be using that club that flies later this year when it returns, which I think is pretty exciting, given the Masters is going on right now. Um, so how do we work with you guys? Um, ultimately, you know, you're sitting here thinking, I might have an idea. It might be relevant. It might not be relevant. It, and that, you know, that's always going to be the case, because not usually are you thinking about doing a space-based research or technology development project. So there has to be a lot of translation, a lot of iterative back and forth. What are your goals? What are the capabilities of station? And how do we match those together? So we talk about microgravity, and we talk about the extreme environment conditions of temperature and radiation and vacuum. We talk about what some of those vantage point earth observation type advantages are. And again, it's this sort of consulting model where we're not charging you, and we're going back and forth saying, how can we achieve your goals best by using that International Space Station as a national lab. And ultimately, as we develop these projects, we will work with you back and forth through this development project, or process, I should say. This is just an example of all of the companies that we've been working with to date. So you're going to recognize a lot of those. If you want to go to the next slide. Ultimately, what I wanted to do is give you an idea, probably in more detail, what the actual projects are. So I mentioned Merck you know, doing a protein crystallization going up. Hopefully, it flies tomorrow. Novartis, the same thing, accelerated muscle wasting. Copra Puma, I mentioned, with the metals testing. All the way through. And you're going to see sort of the big drug companies doing either a drug development or delivery type project. And you're also going to see some names that you don't recognize, like Intuitive Machines that's doing a small payload terrestrial return vehicle. Or NovaWorks is doing um, sort of a nano satellite scale project. Visidine, I mentioned, is doing a, um, a cyclone intensity measurement project. Um, ultimately, each one of these is an example where when we walked in and, and talked to these folks the first time, not one of them thought they had a relevant space-based project idea. And it did take a number of iterations to figure out what that ultimate project could look like. Next. In addition to working with these big companies, and I think this is probably going to be more relevant for the, the folks um, participating today, is we do a lot with accelerators and competitions. So I don't know how many of you all have, uh, are familiar with any of these. Um, the Rice Business Plan Competition is actually taking place in the, at the end, uh, it's in, in two weeks, actually. And we are looking for a project where we're going to fund um, $45,000 plus all of that infrastructure that I talked about. And these are very early stage uh, projects where we will work with the, you know, with the, um, with the PI uh, in terms of identifying what that hypothesis looks like and why they would ever think about doing a project in space station. We're working with the Massachusetts Life Science Center, where we're actually giving away $500,000. And that's happening right now. So for any of you guys based, the, the, the little caveat is you have to be based in Massachusetts. But if you've got an idea, um, you can actually, and based in Massachusetts, you can apply to this galactic grant with the Massachusetts Life Science Center and potentially get up to $500,000, which can go towards that flight project and also to your own internal development of that project. We also work with Mass Challenge, which is a big accelerator, again, in Boston. And there, we partner with Boeing to give an, another $500,000 to projects. And if you go to the next slide, um, can you just go to the next one? Oh, OK, why don't we just stay there then? I was going to give you a, an example of the winners of the Mass Challenge um, uh, exhibit. But ultimately, 
this is a, a, an example of the types of elements that you need to consider when putting together a proposal. So again, we've got funding sources, we work with you in terms of ideas. Ultimately, we want you to come up with a hypothesis. What are you, what are you proving on station? And why is the International Space Station a unique platform for you to be able to do this? Because if you can actually do it in the lab down the hall, you probably should do it in the lab down the hall. You know, we talked about that seven and a half million dollars of infrastructure cost. We, we just don't want to waste that. We want to make sure that we're, u we're using those scarce resources for the right types of projects. Given that we are managing the space station as a national lab, it does have to have Earth-based benefit. So what is that commercial relevance? Is it helping your company accelerate development? Is it helping you position yourself in the market in a better way? Is it bettering uh, humankind? All of those types of, of criteria we evaluate, and we also help you work on a budget. And the key things, and this is what I was just talking about, when we're working together, the key thing is, why is that ISS a unique platform for what you're doing? What is the terrestrial benefit? Um, you know, ultimately, we want things to fly. So a lot of times people, you know, have projects that come to us that they have a lot of groundwork. And, you know, a little bit of groundwork is good, but ultimately, we are focused on flying projects. So we want to see that as part of your, your uh, proposal. The other thing is simple and automated is good because, as I mentioned, the astronauts are your lab techs. Astronaut time is extremely scarce. And I gave you that $7.5 million number. Ultimately, when you cost out what the average salary of an, of an astronaut is, it's about $70,000 per hour. Not that these guys get that, but ultimately their time is very scarce. And what we want to do is make sure that your projects are automated, they're as simple, as, as simple and elegant as possible so that you can carry them out, okay? And then these, this is the example where um, we had very interesting winners from these accelerators and competitions. So I've given you some. We've been involved with Mass Challenge longer, so you're seeing more projects there. Um, last year with the Rice Business Plan competition, we awarded one, which was A76, which was a thin film. It's like a coding kind of project that was applicable, applicable to oil and gas, the oil and gas industry in terms of corrosion with their pipes. Um, so if you look at that list, there's, there's really, you know, not a, a common thread. The, the ideas are all over the, all over the board in terms of the types of projects that we're awarding and we're flying. And again, I would say that in every single case, every single one of these companies, when we first started talking to them, not one of them thought they had a space-based project. So it really is a, a, a process of thinking what is possible given those unique conditions, okay? And then just quickly, I wanted to wrap up talking about STEM. In addition to working with um, big companies, big key accounts that you saw, in addition to small companies, startups, and entrepreneurs, we do a lot from a cases perspective with STEM. And we've got, we have this um, program called the National Design Challenge, which started uh, first in Houston and Denver. We're now rolling it out in Massachusetts as part of that galactic grant. And ultimately, these programs apply to either middle school or high school. And um, what they do is we, we have a competition, if you want to just go to the next slide. Um, we use these very uh, form factor, these CubeSat um, form containers, which have power, which have all sorts of capability in these little nano labs. And we work with um, teachers to actually put together a competition that will use these facility to fly the winning experiment. And the one that we're, carry, that we're doing now in Massachusetts, um, the second place winner is going to do the ground-based experiment. So they're going to go through everything, and they're actually going to, um, in, in a sense, be the ground control of the experiment. The winning school will actually have that ground-based piece, as well as they'll actually fly their experiment. So we are seeing these um, being sort of 
uh, moved out and, and, and were s sort of slowly going across the country. What we really need is just interest. If, if you are aware of you know, school systems or programs that would be interested in these design challenges, we're very happy to work with, with anybody on those. And the, uh, the big part, this sort of explains it. I mean, one of the big things with the STEM programs is it's not just about the ultimate flight. It's about the mentorship. It's about the technology development workshops where you have these experts, these engineers, these science folks, these astronauts. And I'm saying that as I see uh, our astronaut just walk into the room. Um, so it, it's really a great experience for um, for the folks, you know, for the kids that are participating as well as the teachers. And I mentioned the mentors, you can keep going. And these are just examples of the awards on the STEM side. So, you know, it's amazing. I just saw some film from the Denver Challenge, and this was like a middle school um, uh, sort of cohort of, of folks. The types of projects that these guys came up with were, were mind blowing. We're just really, really incredibly impressive. Um, and again, that happens because of this sort of mentorship and sort of what if possibility brainstorming that takes place. And then the last competition I wanna just mention, and I don't know how many uh, folks are, are familiar with Zero Robotics, but this is a program that is um, sort of a joint NASA, MIT, and DARPA funded pro program where they fly these spheres and I don't know if anyone has seen video on YouTube of those spheres, but they're super cool. And I actually put what they stand for, which I had no idea that that's what sphere standard, uh, stood for. But, oh, they are, okay, perfect. Well, th that's good. And, and so I won't belabor the point here, but I think the key is that you, they are a, <laughs> oh, oh, so, okay, so they do need to, know. okay, so basically this is a program which um, uh, applies to high schools as well as middle schools. The high school program takes place September through December, and basically you can start now. You go online, you need to come up with your team, it could be five to 20 type of um, students. You need to find your mentor, and you go on and you apply. And the program begins in the online or the virtual um, competition. And then as things evolve, it becomes um, you know, the in-person uh, competition, which culminates at MIT in December with a live downlink from the International Space Station where the astronauts are actually administering the competition. So you're in there, all of the students are in there, They've programmed the spheres, and basically what it is, is you're given a challenge. So you need to design with coding the speed, the direction of travel, you need to navigate obstacles, you need to deal with power consumption and energy and those types of limiting factors. And ultimately, um, you know, the students design it, it then the, the, the final competition takes place, like I said, with a real downlink, and were, did you participate in Spheres, by the way? Did you? Okay, okay so, so we, we can hear even more about it from, uh, you know, from the, the final judge here. And ultimately, this is a worldwide competition. It's not just US now, we actually are doing it in Europe. And it's one big final culmination with, with one, you know, final winner. And it truly is an amazing experience. So um, the high school, uh, process actually again is September to December and you can go online now you can get all of that information as and the middle school program is more of a summer program where I think it's more about the graphical interface and they're doing things at a different level um, but it still is a really uh, a really great program so I can get you more information for anybody that's interested in the zero robotics program um, but again, everything is online, um, and that's you know sort of how you initiate the process there. And then hopefully, in your remarks, you can give maybe a little bit more in terms of the, the zero robotics. So hopefully, um, you got a sense from the talk today uh, about the fact that the International Space Station, as a national lab, is accessible to you as an entrepreneur, as a student, as a company person, you know, a big key account kind of person. 
Ultimately, we want to make this as accessible and as utilized as possible because it is this tremendous asset and we now are really in this whole mode of how do we get that return to the American taxpayer for all of that infrastructure that was built. Any questions? Thanks. Sure. So I just wanted to jump up partly because of spheres and just because of what we do together. You know, I've actually been this weekend kind of harping on uniforms and the fact that when you see this jacket, you think, oh, so this is a person I'm going to think this way about. This is an organization I'm going to think this way about. It's NASA. That's who goes to space. And I'm hoping that what you're understanding is that NASA, you know, leads the charge, but there are a lot of partners that we have. And CASIS is one of our most important partners right now in that basically we've built a really amazing space station and it is open for business. But in terms of getting experiments up there and operating them, that is actually not something, I mean, that's where you need somebody who can really look and talk to people and, and make it so it's not hard for them. And it's not our forte at NASA. We're a pretty large uh, government organization and we have asked for cases as help. Getting experiments on the space station, that is cases, that is us. We are one in the same in that way. And the, you know, Cindy and I may just be meeting today. I've heard a lot about you for a long time, so I've wanted to meet you. And that we have the same goal, which is to get things that make sense up on the space station. And what I think is really interesting is Basically, in order to do that, what you're seeing here this weekend is how much collaboration is necessary. That it's not gonna be one person that thinks about one kind of thing that makes, uh, that makes a project really work. There has to be somebody that can tell the story. There has to be somebody that can help it find its way. There has to be somebody, the graphic designer person, that makes it look alive to everyone um, else. And you, you guys, as cases, are the people that are bringing all those people together to do the right experiments and helping choose the right experiments for the space station. So it's, it's really nice for me to be here with, with Cindy today. And in terms of the spheres, I mean, that's the perfect example of something that, so these things are soccer ball sized spheres. There's three of them. They're up on the space station and basically everything that happens to them is software. So all the safety checks have been done and now we can have any contest that we want. And uh, the, uh, the inception of them, and I didn't realize this until I went to the big spheres contest, which was just a, a few months ago, was that David Miller, the chief professor, saw the movie Star Wars and saw, you know, saw Luke learning how to, you know, use the lightsaber and there's a little sphere that goes zip, zip, zip. And he looked at his grad students and he said, I want six of those. <laughs> so we have three. <laughs> actually, I think we have four up there. One's a, one's a spear. And, and so it's a, in terms of what we actually want to do in space, we want to understand how to have satellites that know how to rendezvous, how to fix each other, how to exchange information or parts, all those kinds of things. And now we practice that with these soccer ball sized replicas that can act like lots of different things. And we practice those missions, we design them up on the space station. But this is where everywhere from college, I mean, from grownups to college to middle school to younger can design missions for it. And so we have this one experiment and David Miller designed it and he has a certain skill, certain path he can think of, but all these other paths, especially the one that Casus is taking spheres on, are not ones that he could have envisioned alone. And so a team approach is just the right way. And we're really excited about working with Casus because it is the way to get your experiments to the International Space Station. Thank you, wow. I hope you're speaking next. And I, could you, could you just do me a favor and could you just come on every, presentation because you just said it better than I just said in 30 minutes. So thanks to Katie for that. We, we might have a, a question or two for, for Cindy. Just uh, from a local point of view, um, do you have any relationships with, the, off the top of your head, with New York City schools or colleges or the Board of Education here? Um, I don't know. I, I know that the majority of our initial work, like I said, was in Texas, was in Colorado, and now Massachusetts. To the extent that we um, bring in other school systems through the National Design Challenge, it's happening, but it's not necessarily, I don't have that landscape, but I can find out. And as a matter of fact, it's probably a good idea if you've got connections to those that we should follow up um, so that we could have those conversations. 
So if that's where your question was going, I'd love to talk with you after this. Is all the STEM effort K through 12 or does some of it go to undergraduate as well? Um, the majority of STEM is, is high school or middle school. So in terms of university STEM, um, I'm not necessarily aware. I think the majority of the stuff we're doing with universities is through sort of entrepreneur and through these accelerators and competitions, which is probably the other avenue that we see the majority of our project work coming through. Any other questions for Cindy? No, go in here. Um, so I, I work with one of the coordinators of education for the Museum of Art and Design. Um, a, a lot of the exciting stuff to me as a sort of a technical person is like technical, but um, could you envision a way that there would be a more design end, more art end, where conveying your message and conveying some of the ideas to a group of artists or practicing designers or students um, in line with the values of the Museum of Art and Design? And I don't know, I'm, I'm looking at Katie to see if she has any um, uh, input there, but I know that we had done work originally with the Museum of Science in Boston, and we were looking at art challenges as a part of that. Um, that never sort of moved forward from my project standpoint. Um, from a NASA side, are you guys gonna talk about that? Do you have examples? Because I know that the whole notion of art and the, the softer side of science is a very important part. You know, every astronaut, I think, talks about sort of the art and the humanity piece of, of when you return from I, space. From I know space. that you, NASA just hired a, yeah? Sure. Yeah, because I know NASA just hired a visual data artist. Yeah, so. <laughs> Okay, great. Let's thank uh, Cindy again. Thank that was a great you. talk.